Listen, just to clue everyone in, we have a young man in this church who is uh, 15 years old, as Don said, is a, a wrestler, and a very good wrestler. He's been wrestling all, all his, his young life. And he uh, is a homeschooler, but he wrestles for the Linmar. Um, and he qualified for state. Last year he won third in state, and this year he qualified for state. But he's had a lifelong conviction. It was, didn't come from us, or it didn't come even from his parents. It was from the Holy Spirit, the Lord. He's a Christian. And the conviction is, if a girl ever comes out to wrestle me, I refuse to treat a woman that way. Women are not to be used that way. That is against his religion. And um, they prayed for six months, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> because they knew that he'd probably go to state, and they prayed and begged God that he would not have a girl. But when you're in the 112 weight, weight class, um, that's probably where most of the girls are, all right? And sure enough, first round of state, he's, he's ranked number five. He, he's, he could actually take the championship. A girl stepped out. And wouldn't you know it, it was a perfect storm because... It was already historic that a girl, actually two girls in his weight class, qualified for state. In all of the history of Iowa high school uh, wrestling, which is very, very world-renowned, there's never been a girl that qualified for state until this year. They prayed for six months that he wouldn't have to uh, face a girl at the state tournament, and that was the first round. So we see in this the good hand of our God. Now, I was talking to... Um, one of the one of the sisters, Erica, about, and I'm sure you you were talking about this too with with her about the significance of Des Moines, that this had to play out in Des Moines because the big debate in the state house is on to whether or not, uh, you know, homosexual marriage. But really, underneath homosexual marriage and even underneath homosexuality, the real sin is the rejection of the God assigned roles for male and female. And so God ordained that Joel have to testify to his Christian faith in that setting. I'll wait until you take him. He's gonna wrestle that little girl. <laughs> we do a lot of wrestling around here. <laughs> God wanted that to happen. And I want to say that within five minutes, see, I, I, I'm glad Joel's not here because Joel didn't do this to go, draw attention to himself. And I don't think Joel had any idea what he was doing other than testifying to his faith and, and paying the price for it. And this is not about praising Joel. Joel's doing what any Christian should do. All he's doing is serving God. That's what we should all do, right? But I, he's greatly encouraged us. But listen, within five minutes, that story went around the world. If you Google it, it was in Russia, it was in India, it was everywhere, all over the place. It was discussed everywhere. And you think about that for a minute. Why, 20 years, or 20, 30 years ago, I guess, when I was in high school wrestling, if someone would have said, hey, you think I'll have girls wrestling? I, I, I wasn't saved. I'd probably go, yeah, oh, yeah, bring it on. But, but we would have laughed at the idea. It would have been absurd. What is this te a testimony of? Our world has gone perverse. Our world is on its head. Our world is hurtling toward judgment. That now um, it becomes controversial that a boy won't body slam a girl or do a double leg takedown or a high crotch or an arm bar. That's controversial. Welcome to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what is the church supposed to do? We bear witness to the truth. We bear witness to the truth. I hope nobody loses the significance of this. I'm not overblowing it. It wasn't me that put it in the newspapers in Russia or China or all over the world. That was God. And we're not exploiting it. I wish I could claim credit for, you know, Joel. But, you know, there's been a lot of correspondence and feedback. And, unbelieving people say, oh, you're, you know, you're trying to claim credit for Joel. We can't cre claim credit for Joel. Get credit his parents. Credit Jesus. This, this is another thing. 
Joel has never, ever had a wrestling event in all his life where his father wasn't right there by his side. And you, it would take either wild horses or a baby to keep his father from going to Des Moines. <laughs> in this case, it was a baby. This is of God. This is all of God. And this is huge. Listen. Uh, the, uh, Martin Luther once said, if I uphold everything in the truth of God except that one point that the world is contesting, then I'm denying Christ. And I, I want to point to another significance of it, although we don't take any credit for it. And we can't. But how many times have we sat in this half-empty room and cried out to God that our voice would go beyond these four walls? God can do more in five minutes than the most best programmed church can do in their whole lifetime. And the, the feedback has been incredible for both love and hate. The other thing is that the Holy Spirit gave him wisdom to write it down so it would not be distorted. In fact, if Joel was not drawing attention to himself, he submitted the statement to the athletic director at Linmar High School he did not do anything to draw attention to himself. I mean, well, he's a real credit to all of us. Also, though, I do want to give props to Linmar High School. We've often condemned the public school system, and there's a lot to condemn there. But they stood behind him, and so we thank God for that. We, we're really blessed. We are so blessed. And this is all over the Internet and all over uh, talk, radio. and I mean, it's everywhere. And uh, I just... I just thank God for it, and I just thank God for answering the prayers. And I thank God, too, for an example of a, a young man who said no to the world and would not go along with the fantasy that the world is constructing. See, that's what this is all about. Go to John chapter 12. Let this be a teachable moment and let us pray to God that when our time comes, our moment comes, that we will stand for Christ and that we'll recognize, that we'll recognize it's a stand for Christ. A lot of people think, well, a stand for Christ is limited to, are you a Christian or not? If you say you're a Christian, I'll blow your head off. Well, that is a stand for Christ, I suppose, but that's not what it's limited to. The world doesn't mind Christians as long as it's a living room religion, a parlor game a social gospel. The world doesn't mind Christianity like that. But the world actually hates real Christianity. I don't think they even know it half the time. But events like this bring it out. John chapter 12. Let's see. Let's see. John 12, verse 30. One. Now is the judgment of this world. And now shall the prince of this world be cast out. I just want to talk about that for a minute. Now is the judgment of this world. And now is the prince of this world cast out. First of all, this world... He's not talking about the globe. He's not talking about the earth. He's talking about humanity as it's organized itself without God. It's called the world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man has the love of the world, he can't have the love of the Father. You see, you can't have both. There can be no neutrality. You have to get on a side. That's the world. Prince of this world? He's, he's going he's to refer to him again in John 14. Go to John 14. Let's look at the last verse. I believe it is. Oh, yeah, John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. 
the prince of this world comes. There's nothing in me. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. Who is the prince of this world? The prince of this world is no one less than Satan himself. Satan is called by the Apostle Paul, the god of this age. See, that's another word, meaning of the word world in the Bible. It's not the globe, not necessarily. It's the age. So it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus died to save us from this evil age. The prince of this age is cast out. Now the prince of this age comes, Jesus says, but he doesn't have anything in me. There's nothing resonating in me that he can grab a hold of, take advantage. The prince of this age. <clears throat> and we go back to the scripture of John 12. Now is the judgment of this world. And the word judgment has to do with the word crisis. And what is a biblical meaning of a crisis? A crisis is something that happens in which everyone has to take one side or the other side. They can't be neutral. They've got to get on one side or the other side. And Jesus is he's speaking about the cross and he says, now is the crisis of this world and now is the prince of this world cast down. It's a crisis. Cross forces and a decision. It's a crisis that began a long time ago. And the end of the prince of this world is a long time ago. And the final judgment of this world is a long time ago. But it's still playing out. And the way it plays out is what we just saw a few days ago. You've got to take a side. You've got to figure out whose side you're on. You've got to take a stand. See... A non-decision is a decision. You've got to stand. I think of many scriptures come to mind that support this. Joshua 24 says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or Deuteronomy. See, I be set before you life and death. But what does he say? Choose life that you may live. A non-choice is a choice. To not choose life is to choose death. This one now is the crisis of this world. How about the one in Luke 11? Whoever is not for me is against me, Jesus said. See, it's a crisis that runs right down to the year 2011 and right through the hearts of men, and as we saw this weekend, right through the state wrestling tournament in Des Moines, Iowa, of all places, the crisis, it just keeps emanating from the cross, forcing a decision. You see, the world, in truth, the world is hostile to God and to Christ, and this is hard for people to realize, because the world itself often doesn't know it. Look at John chapter 15. John 15. They wouldn't see themselves as hostile to Christ. After all, we just had Christmas, and we got the beautiful carols and the baby and the cards, and Christ is wonderful. Christ is wonderful as long as he could be ignored uh, unless Christmas or Easter comes. We're coming on Easter. The world will go to church on Easter. A lot of people go to church. But as long as you can deal with him and put him away and, and he doesn't really factor in to your daily life, uh, the world can deal with Christ. But the real Christ and the demands of the real Christ, make no mistake about it, the world hates that. Now is the crisis of this world. See, what happens is because of the cross, a crisis is formed. Jesus said that it would be like this. In fact, he said the line would go right even through families. I would come to set men against their uh, the fathers against the children and the children against the fathers and sons-in-laws and brothers-in-laws and sisters and cousins. The, th the line goes right through the family. John chapter 15, verse 21. Oh, excuse me, go back to verse 18. If the world hates you, 
you know that it hated me before it hated you. Okay, that's one thing to remember. It's not really personal. It's about Jesus. It's, about, it's personal about Jesus. But I'm willing to stand with Jesus, and I hope we all are. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. And by the way, the world, in this sense, is a value system, an outlook. The world knows its own. The world loves people like Joel Osteen. It's right in line. It's the same value system. It makes sense. If, the, if you were of the world, the world would love you. The world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I was of the world, but I heard a call that took me out of the world. It's a new value system. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Verse 20. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. Now listen, persecution is a big spectrum. It can go from mild rejection to being thrown in a concentration camp. Okay, that's another word people don't get. Oh, there's no persecution here yet. Wait a minute, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Of course there's persecution here. They just haven't set up the concentration camps and I pray they never do. But rejection is real. And it comes out in things like this. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they don't know him that sent me. Now the world is going to hate us because they don't know God. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Well, it gets worse. Not only do they not know God, but like Romans says, they don't want to know God. They suppress the knowledge of God. That makes it worse. And you know what even makes it worse than that? And it goes beyond ignorance and becomes sin. If I hadn't come and spoken to them, see, the sin compounds. Because Jesus is a revelation of God. Jesus is God come to us in the flesh. Because Jesus has come and spoken to them, their guilt is even worse. If I hadn't spoken to them, they wouldn't have sin, he says. That, that, to me, that tells me that the sin of rejecting the words of Jesus Christ, the sin of repudiating Christ, makes all other sins pale in comparison. He's literally saying, if they, since I've come and spoken to them and they won't hear me, if, if that hadn't been the case, they wouldn't even have any sin. Whoa. And he goes on to say that this willful uh, ignorance is a manifestation of God hatred. Verse 23. He that hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they had not had sin. But now they've both seen and hated both me and my father. The world is a true citadel of hostility against God and Christ. This is why many people are afraid to take a stand for Christ. Because they don't want to be subject to what's called the reproach of Christ. Let not this moment pass us by that just happened. It's of huge import. People have literally said, totally, they don't get it. What's the big deal? Okay, all right, that's cool, that's brave, a little boy showed courage. But what's the big deal? No, there's many, many deeper issues here. Profound issues. And we should thank the Lord that he counted us worthy, a little scattered flock, ravaged and despised, rejected. And yet he gave us one brief moment so far to speak to people in Russia, China, all over the world. Amazing, really. But I hope that we're ready to take the reproach. See, the world doesn't see that they hate Christ. But these are the words of Christ, see. But they hate the confession of the Lordship of Christ when it's confessed firmly like that. I mean, think about this issue itself. What, it, there's so much more than meets the eye. What's he saying when he won't wrestle a girl? I'm not going along with feminism. 
I'm not going to buy into the androgynous lie that's being perpetrated, that there is no difference between a man and a girl other than plumbing. I'm not buying it. I will not be part of the rejection of the God-assigned roles for man and woman. That's why a boy defaulting in a wrestling meet instantly goes around the world. That's how feminized the world's gotten. It's frightening, really. By the way, I've found through this that you don't have to be a woman to be a feminist. There are more men that are feminists than women. Because what is feminism? Feminism is not the love of femininity. It's the rejection of it. Feminism is the rejection of that which makes a woman, uh, that God made a woman special. Uh, God gave a woman a womb. God gave, caused a woman to be a nurturer, a mother, a wife. You know, these girls go into combat. That's spiritual. That is part of the world's rebellion. Girl wrestlers, like I say, 30 years ago at Prairie, we would have smirked at that. Couldn't have conceived of it. Now it's controversial that a Christian won't participate. It's another way of saying, the emperor has no clothes. This is fake. This construct, this lie is fake. Well, what would we expect of the abortion culture? See, the Bible says of Noah, by faith, Noah, building an ark, condemned the world. No, Noah didn't go out to condemn the world as an end in itself. That's not what the Bible's saying. Noah did not go out to condemn the world, but the very erection of an ark was a condemnation of the world because it's a statement. This world is under judgment. Wrath is coming. You're not living right. And for every Noah, I'm sure there's 400 ancient Joel Osteens and other preachers saying, hey, don't worry, everything's cool. Robert Schuller is alive and well all through all generations. You don't have to repent. How narrow-minded. Jesus doesn't think you're a sinner. You're fine just the way you are. Who are they going to listen to, Noah? Or the guy that's condemning him, building an ark. The cross is the condemnation. It's the biggest negative in the world. Why does there need to be a cross? Because you and I are sinful people who cannot make our way back to God without divine intervention. This bloody, messy, awful, sacrificial, pouring out of the life of the most precious person ever, the Son of God. That's the only way we could get to God. And thus, people instinctively hate the cross. You telling me I'm a sinner? Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. Right. He didn't have to. The cross is the biggest condemnation you can fathom. He didn't have to stand up there and hang on the cross and, and preach against the world. The cross is a sermon against the world. That there's only one way that you can get to heaven. Only one way. And that's through the bloody sacrifice that God has ordained. The world hates the cross. They hate the confession of the Lordship of Christ. They hate Jesus because he condemns. Look at John 7. See, we gotta, we got to take a stand. That's the, <laughs> we got to choose. That's one of the lessons of the last week. Now I want you to think about this. Once again, I'm not praising Joel. Joel's doing what any Christian should do. I'm not praising him. He wouldn't want that, and it's not about that, and he didn't do this for praise. He, he serves Christ. He plays to an audience of one. That's why I'm kind of glad he's not here. Okay. But he didn't come to the state wrestling tournament and demand that they change the rules for him or force his way or condemn these girls. In fact, if you read his written statement, he commended the girls. I'm proud of these girls. I'm not ashamed to say I'm proud of Joel. I would hope anyone from here or any Christian anywhere would take that kind of stand. Why is this a serpent harmless as a dove, right? 
Let us not lose the meaning. Let us not let the moment pass by. It's not just a curiosity or an oddity that someone, someone from among us is on Fox and Friends. It's more than that. It's a conflict that runs right through the world, and that's why it became instantaneously contentious around the world. We have received an outpouring of love and encouragement by phone and by email and by computer. We have also received much, much uh, hatred, rejection, misappropriation of our motives and what we are. I don't care. I really don't care. All, I ma all that matters to us is what Jesus Christ thinks of us, right? I don't think we're going to get elected Church of the Year. I wouldn't want to. <laughs> See, the world hates the implications of the cross. John 7, 7. The world can't hate you. He's saying to his brothers, the world can't hate you. Boy, that's, a, that's an indictment. The world can't hate you, but me it hates. Why? Because I testify of it. That the works thereof are evil. You know what? Homosexuality is evil. So is feminism. So is the rejection of the God and signed roles. Those things are not just political viewpoints. That is evil. Because you cannot come to that from the revelation of God. That's a construct of humanity. That's, that's godless. And that is an expression of God rebellion. The world hates the claims of the Christian church that are exclusive. We will not say that anybody can get to heaven from any religion. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Do you believe that? Amen. You're willing to bear the reproach of that. Because we live in a pluralistic day. And the world hates our call for them to be reconciled to God, because that implies that they're not. There's such a guilt just in participation of the evil. You know, someone says, you know, I can see why really, 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 really bad people, Hitler, and the, I can see why they'd go to hell. But why would someone that pays their bills and on time and mows their lawn and maybe even their neighbor's lawn, why, why are they going to hell if they don't accept Christ? Just participation in the world on any level. There's participation in um, uh, its viewpoint, its, its outlook is rebellion against God, okay? Um, but I want to I move on to my next point here, is that, that, is that in most of history, and most of the world, the rest of the world, the world's hatred of God is over, it's right out there. Go to China and visit pastors in prison, hard labor for their life just because they're Christians. Go to Russia. Greek Orthodox Church is starting to knock heads of evangelicals, okay? Go anywhere in the world. Go to Africa. Go to the Muslim world. Go to Saudi Arabia, our, our ally, in which if you're even caught with, with a prayer meeting in your house, you'll be killed, okay? That's the, that's the norm. But here, for the time being, it's a subtle way that the world's God hatred is being expressed. It's subtle, and we have to be on guard against it, lest we inadvertently take the wrong side. Okay. It's not out-and-out out persecution of beatings and arrests. It's actually more like ignore, ignore God altogether and insist that everybody else ignore God in all public discourse, okay? It's insistence on something that I call the myth of neutrality. You're supposed to be objective. Don't bring your religion into history. Don't bring your religion into law. Don't bring your religion into entertainment. It's a constant pressure from the world to just X God out. 
It might even be better if they just openly came against God than if they, it, it, this, this heavy, stultifying myth that they're tolerant and neutral and that, we, we, you know, don't bring your religion into anything in all realms, education, art, law, journalism, entertainment, everywhere possible, they will X God out. They won't give a Joel credit for having faith in God. They say, their headline, a lot of them say, boy afraid to face girl, or boy is not willing to face girl, okay? You take a history class of the pilgrims, they're not thanking God, they're thanking the Indians, okay? In everywhere, in this culture, the, the, the God hatred is manifest by a deliberate ignoring of any positive thing from God. And it's camouflage. Their hostility toward God is camouflage by the word tolerance. Christians even are cowed and bowed and scraped to this notion by the external pressure. Who, well, who, who would we be to impose our values on them, you know? They want to make Christianity private, which means irrelevant. And we're supposed to go along with it. The goal is to silence the Christian disciple. In the first place, there is no neutrality, none whatsoever. Really, there's only two viewpoints, only two worldviews, a Christian worldview and an anti-Christian worldview. A non-Christian worldview cannot be a non-Christian worldview. It has to be anti-Christian because Christ makes exclusive claims. Scripture doesn't allow neutrality regarding the claims of Christ and God. It's a myth. Everybody has presuppositions that they bring to the table. Everybody has to make a choice. Everybody has to recognize. See, like I say, if it's a non-essential issues, the world doesn't mind Christianity that uh, goes out and does good social work and sets up basketball courts and teaches inner city kids how to crochet. That's all good. That's, that's what the church is for. But like Erica was saying, you stand up in Des Moines, Iowa. See, God set that up. Des Moines, Iowa, where homosexual marriage, well, they're trying to get a debate. The tolerant ones won't even allow a debate. They just foisted on us. And I don't think he thought about that. A young man just chose Christ and truth. Wouldn't go along with the game. And boom, instantly. They're talking about it on Fox News. Think about it. There's a scripture that says, wisdom cries out in the streets. You believe that? Wisdom's crying out every day. If people have ears to hear, wisdom cries out. And I, I don't even think I can go too much further because I think I've said everything that I have to say except this. Just remember really what the church is all about. We weren't put into existence to be someone's meals on wheels or teach knitting or crocheting to the poor, okay? Jesus said, the reason I came into this world is to bear witness to the truth. All that are of the truth shall hear my voice. Are you of the truth? You cannot believe the polarization. You cannot believe the love and hate that has come in because of this. You cannot believe how many people have been going along with the charade even though they know better. And they wrote and say, thank you. Joel, and thank your parents. Say, it's, it's obvious. The emperor has no clothes. Men and women are different. We got to the point where we got to state the obvious because the lie is so prevalent. Just going along with the lie, just playing along and going the path of least resistance, this is denying Christ. 
You're going to see a new tolerance among confessing Christians of homosexuality. You're going to see a new tolerance among confessing Christians probably of Islam is next. The new tolerance, the myth of neutrality is taking Christians right out of the game. You know, we got to just figure out where we stand, just who we are, and what we're all about. Amen? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. In the beginning, God made them male and female, created he them. Yes, he created them different, but equal. See, it's radical egalitarianism, but it's, it's beyond egalitarianism. People say, if you really respected that girl, you'd wrestle her. Well, not if I respected her as a girl. That's the point. We respect women as women. Okay. God made men and women different. Remember that the creation tells us that God took the dust of the earth and molded it. And literally, God is hands dirty and formed man and breathed into him the breath of life. But God didn't make women that way. Isn't this amazing that I have to remind a congregation of the creation? God didn't make women by molding dirt. I never met any moldy women. <laughs> you know where it says he took his rib? Literally, it says he took his side. He took out a side, a side of beef, a side of man. He made man out of refined dirt, but he made women out of a refined man. The first blood shed was before the fall, not after it. The first operation, the first surgery. And the man stands there with a a cut in his side in the Garden of Eden. He's brought up. He's brought back. God says, it's not good that man be alone. Right? It's not good. The first not good is before the fall and before sin. Not good that man be alone. And so... To turn a not good into good looks awful lot like death and resurrection, doesn't it? He puts man into a deep sleep. And he takes his side. And when the man comes up out of the sleep with a cut and a wound in his side, and he's presented with someone so beautiful and refined, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and those two shall be one flesh. But the man's eyes were not yet dimmed by sin. Therefore, he looked far ahead into the future to see the real bridegroom with a cut in his side being presented with the true bride, the church, the worshipers of Christ, and everything else that denies that. Everything that distorts that is so evil, we can't fathom it. It's not just a discussion point for Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity. It goes deeper, deeper, deeper than that. This is the world's opposition to the only holy God. It's deep. And now he summons us. Nobody's. Nothing, nothing to see here. And yet he gives us a chance to speak to it. I praise him. I praise you. Father, we praise you. We put ourselves at your disposal. And we ask you to use us. And we ask that we can bear the reproach of Christ without fear, without compromise. And we ask that we can be gentle to our enemies and love them, but speak the truth that we be harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. We cry out to you to forgive us of our sins, that we might be useful in thy hands. And we pray that Joel's example would uh, be used by you to incite other Christians to stand up for virtue and truth and love. 
We ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, God bless you. You're dismissed.